Dr. Nuremberg's Mind-Body Workout System. Welcome, 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 my dear brothers and sisters. It's a privilege to be in your presence, to have the honor of addressing you on a very important topic. And it's your presence that brings out the inspirations to bring to you knowledge uh, and hopefully to inspire you to looking into your heart to find other inspirations of knowledge as well. Today's class is a, a unique one called Momentary Maximal Exertion. Momentary Maximal Exertion, MME. The subtitle is Resurge with Health and Longevity. Resurge with Health and Longevity. We're going to go into the genetic blueprint behind MME training, uh, what the MME training is specifically. We're going to go into the physiological and psychological effects. Uh, and, and very importantly, we're going to talk about the theory. It's a new theory, cutting edge, that I've come up with that I'm going to present to you. I'm going to start uh, today's class with the theory, and then we're going to end where I repeat the theory again. So I'm going to tell you the theory, and then we're going to go into all the data or ideas and data around it. The theory is this, the momentary maximal exertion, which means an exerting yourself to the maximum from 1 to 30 seconds will actually turn on the longevity genes to help you lead a longer life and a healthier life. Now, what do I mean by turning on longevity genes? We know for a fact that calorie, calorie restriction, where you reduce your calories substantially, will actually activate longevity genes to make you live longer. You want to write that down in your mind or take a note on it. Calorie restriction activates longevity genes. And that's a fact. That's not a theory. So you, people will live longer when they restrict the calories. So calorie restriction is abbreviated in the literature as CR. Now there are what are called CR mimetics. You want to write that down, CR mimetics. A CR mimetic is anything that will imitate or have the body or your physiology duplicate what happens when you have calorie restrictions. And we know of certain food supplements that will do that, such as resveratrol. It's one of the most important supplements you can take is resveratrol. The reason red wine is probably beneficial is because it has the, the grape in it and the resveratrol content. So, but you can't, you'd have to drink a lot of wine to get what you get out of one capsule of resveratrol. There are other CR mimetics, such as coracetin with, red, with the grapeseed extract. Coracetin with grapeseed extract. These are CR mimetics. They activate longevity genes and mechanisms that keep you healthier and you live longer. Some of the mechanisms could, uh, would include <coughs> facilitating the health of the endothelial cells in the arteries. We have more nitrous oxide released. Nitrous oxide dilates the blood vessels. When the blood vessels dilate, and they, as they stay more supple and they dilate, you have more delivery of oxygen and, and uh, other nutrients. Delivery of amino acids, delivery of glucose, and so forth. But there are actual genes. Now, we know that genetic makeup is very important, but you have to, we have to realize that genes become expressed or not expressed. So you could have a, a gene that leads to longevity, but you have to, it has to be turned on. Somebody has to turn on that gene, such as calorie restrictions or the CR mimetics. Or certain genes if they're turned on, will lead to diseases, cancer or cardiovascular disease, whatever, so you want to be able to suppress those gene expressions. Now, the theory that I'm presenting to you today is that MME, momentary maximal exertion, is a CR mimetic, that it will actually turn on your longevity gene. That is the theory. We do not have empirical proof of that, but I'm going to go through a lot of data that we do have proof of, but this is uh, the theory that I'm presenting, that MME is a CR mimetic. Now, before we go to the, the next section, I'm going to stop periodically and leave you time to 
make comments or ask questions. This is a very broad, uh, a very big statement I'm making to you. It's a very bold statement that MME is a CR mimetic. Well, let's go to our genetic blueprint. Let's look at our, let's take some guesses about what it was like to be back in the caveman days, 10, 20,000 years ago, 30,000 years ago. When you look at a fight then, or you look at a fight now between two people or, and extrapolate back, most fights last less than 30 seconds. It's momentary maximal exertion, usually over in 30 seconds. One just pounds the other, the other realizes they've been beaten and they, and they submit. It's, it's over pretty quickly. You know who's going to take this fight pretty quickly. So when you look at our ancestors, you look at our, the cavemen, their survival was dependent on MME. If they had into a fight with another person, it was 1 to 30 seconds. Most of it. Sometimes, of course, it could go longer, but generally, that's how long it would take. So hitting each other or grabbing a rock and pounding the other, whatever. Now, if they had to fight an animal, uh, either because they were hunting or being hunted, it's going to go 1 to 30 seconds. One, one is going to kill the other in that period of time or immobilize the other and then kill the other. It's going to be 1 to 30 seconds. not going to be a half hour. Uh, it's going to be over pretty quickly. So again, you're looking at momentary maximal exertion. Well, let's say a person had to move. A, they were in the cave. Some boulders got in the way or a tree was in the way. They had to move that boulder, uh, move the tree, <clears throat> so, you know, wrap, very focused mo MME, momentary maximal exertion. That would be a pretty common scenario. Or a momentary maximum exertion could be a sprint. Uh, if they're being chased by a tiger or a lion or a bear, which, and these animals are faster than we are now, and they were then as well, you had about 30 seconds to get to safety. You get, behind, get up a tree or get behind some cover where, they, where that animal can't get in. Because if it went longer than that, that animal's going to get you and pounce on you. You probably had you know, 1 to 30 seconds to really run to safety. So we're looking at 1 to 30 seconds. And the other part that, we could, as we look back, we all know about the, the caveman and the grunt. Everybody's, you hear about the grunt, the caveman's grunt. You've heard of the, you know, the grunt, grunt and grab. I have a theory. I'm going to tell you how I feel that ties into it. It's called uh, intra-abdominal pressure. You want to write that down. Intra-abdominal pressure, IAP. What is that? Well, in any cavity of the abdomen are receptors. And when you're compressing what I, what, what's called the, the mystery, the secret strength muscle, I'm going to tell you what the secret strength muscle is. It's your diaphragm. The diaphragm is the muscle that separates the gut from the lungs. And so when you're pressing down on that, you're pressing down on your diaphragm that activates the receptors, and your, every muscle in your body is stronger momentarily. So you get a grunt, so it goes like this. <coughs> so pressing down, and I'm not trying to make this sound. It's not like, it's not an exhale that counts. It's not even the sound that counts. It's the, it's the grunt. The, but the grunt came, when you hear even in martial arts, we hear those sounds, when it's done right, those sounds should be not the, the goal, but a side effect of intra-abdominal pressure, IAP. And so whether a person, if they're a power lift, they want to do a bench press or do a deadlift or a squat or a power pull-up, pushing a truck, whatever it is, the feat of strength is, most Western athletes don't understand the intra-abdominal pressure. In the East, they do. The Russians understand it more. Martial artists understand it more. I think the classic example would be Bruce Lee, when you see him fighting. He weighed 135 pounds. But if you watch him, he's <coughs> you just see him. <coughs> so the grunt, and my theory about the grunt of the caveman is it was part of IAP, 
which was for the strength to get MME, momentary maximal exertion. That's my theory about what the grunt was about. So that's the genetic blueprint we have. Now, we still have that genetic blueprint. We're living in a society today that's not consistent with the times where our genes are based on what was, what was the case 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 years ago. So if we don't live in accordance with our genetic makeup, there are negative health consequences. If we live in harmony with our genetic makeup, there are many health benefits where our health resurges, our energy resurges, our longevity resurges, and resurging, I've given a number of lectures on resurging the new science of energy, power, and longevity. And the term that you want to write down is resurging. The new science of energy, power, and longevity. So again, when we live in accordance with our genetic makeup, there's a resurging of health, a resurging of energy, a resurging of power. And when we don't, it's a use it or lose it. If, we, if we're not using that genetic makeup, we, genes start shutting down. But to activate maximal genetic uh, optimization of resurging and of power, longevity, and health, we have to live in accordance with that. And part of that is MME. Part of it is MME. Now, to do MME you can really hurt yourself if you're not in shape. So that's where, the, what I'm going to talk to you about is your general condition and working out your whole body, doing sprints, doing uh, a wide variety of exercises, using body weight, using weights. To do all that, to, so your body is strong, so that when you do MME, you're not going to hurt yourself. Because if you go MME and you've been having a soft lifestyle, you're, gonna, you're going to... Uh, pull a tendon or maybe get a muscle tear, a tendon tear, a ligament. So you have to be in good overall condition. But the theory that I'm presenting to you is that the fruit of all conditioning, the fruit, the harvest is MME. It's to get you ready for that one time where you need to focus and just give everything you've got for a short period. That that's the harvest and the fruit of all the conditioning. And if you don't do MME, then you're missing out on the fruit. You'll, you'll get overall conditioning, and it has certain cardiovascular benefits and other benefits, but you miss out on, on the full harvest of it. That's the theory that I'm presenting to you. Now, that's a pretty radical statement, a very bold statement. I've never heard it made. I'm making that statement to you as a power athlete for over 56 years, as a world champion power lifter and a world champion bodybuilder. Now, I'm going to give you a chance, to, this is again a pretty bold statement, any comments or questions uh, to this point? Yeah, Does this Flora. apply only to bodybuilding or? Anything in life, good question. Uh, it's bodybuilding, powerlifting, or just living in general. I mean, our ancestors, uh, they, didn't, they weren't bodybuilding, they weren't powerlifters, they were just trying to survive. And so they want MME to fight a, an enemy from another clan or another tribe, or they're fighting some animal, or they're moving something heavy uh, for, for protection and security. Uh, so it applies to anybody, uh, including women. Women had to then also do these things. I mean, they, they were taking care of the children and whatnot, and maybe doing some gathering of berries, but, they, but because it was such a treacherous life, they also had to go maximal exertion, momentary maximal exertion as well. You know, if the males were around, that would be their role, but women, I'm sure, were confronted many times with it. So this is not just for a power athlete. It's for anybody in life if they want to turn on their longevity genes, uh, that MME being a CR mimetic uh, needs to be able to do that. But again, you don't want to do MME if you're not in condition. You will hurt yourself. If all of a sudden you're trying to move that refrigerator, uh, you need to just push it a few inches so you can get to the plug in the back. And, and there's no wheels on it, you, you really hurt yourself. But if you're in general conditioning, that MME, that shove of moving the fridge, uh, is good for you, according to the theory I'm presenting. What if you do that grunt? <laughs> the grunt helps. Again, the grunt, though, is, is, a, is, a, is not the main thing. It's really because <clears throat> you're pressing down on the, on the diaphragm. 
the secret strength muscle, the diaphragm, the muscle that separates the gut from the lungs. It's a secret strength mechanism because, again, it presses against the, abdo the abdo abdominal walls. We have receptors that activate strength in all your muscles, not just in your triceps or your biceps or your quads. I mean, all your muscles are strengthened by it. This you, is you answered my question about the diaphragm and, you know, the pressure on it. And yeah. you said it activates the strength in all your muscles when you do that? All your muscles. There's a, is there a specific, like, um, activity that you can do to strengthen well, well, it? Do, yeah, do, just do it right. Take a moment now. And what you want to do is push down, push the air down, push it down. Now you feel belly, your, 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 your abdomen will extend because as you push it down, your organs are pushed to the side. So push it down. Do you feel it? Yeah. And it's, again, that's, that's for MME because you, you can't do that for too long. It's just it's down for a couple of seconds. And when people are punching, uh, uh, an experienced box will, as he's hitting, he's <coughs> get, <coughs> just, and then he's pressed down on it. Some air escapes, and that's where the sound comes from. But some people think the sound is the important thing, or the exhale is the important thing. It's not. That's for strength. In terms of strength, it's a byproduct of the IAP, intra-abdominal pressure. It's a byproduct of that. And you, you got to do it. How to feel when you did it? Yeah, like you can feel your core. Well, that's what I associate it with, where it does expand. Yeah, and, and your belly comes out a little. Your yeah. organs are pushed aside. Were you able to do that, Floor? How that feel when you did it? Yeah. You feel it, and uh, you fell down there. Yeah. Rick, how was it when you did it? I can feel it. <laughs> wow. And so when you see martial artists and they're making those sounds. It's a result of the IAP. So is it, um, like Dr. Steve explained to me with Bruce Lee, again, that analogy, where with his kia, is that where he's releasing the exertion? Yeah, he's that? pushing his diaphragm down. If you see him, he's all tensed up like that. I mean, he's doing his abdominal breathing, which is very healthy breathing because you're, you're, you're imagining that your, your lungs are down in your belly and you're doing belly breathing. But... What we're talking about in terms of strength, we're not talking about the exchange of gases, taking in oxygen, exhaling carbon dioxide. When we're talking about IAP, we're really talking about strength. And so we're not talking about your inhalation, your exhalation. We're talking about strictly IAP, intra-abdominal intra pressure, where you're pushing the diaphragm down. But belly breathing or diaphragmatic breathing is, is very healthy. It certainly strengthens the diaphragm when you're doing it. And you want your diaphragm getting stretched a muscle. And, and it's, it's working all the time when you're breathing. When you exhale, it's, uh, when, it, it's, it's, it's going one way. When you inhale, it's going the other way. And when it's coming up, then it, it's, the, the organs then come back into place more. Your lungs uh, go one way. It goes down. It put, when it goes down, it's pulling air into your lungs. So did that power punch come from that pressure on the diaphragm? Yeah, diaph that's right. The power punch come, came from IAP. Right, again, with the right intra-abdominal pressure. Now, there's another part of our genetic blueprint from, from our ancestors. Uh, they had a lot of downtime. I mean, you know, we're going at a pretty frenetic pace in modern-day society. But most likely, the, the caveman... Um, a lot of downtime. I mean, if you look at a lion, for example, let's, let's switch from, away from humans to, say, a lion. They're sleeping about 90% of the time. And then once in a while, they get up, go pounce on some animal, kill it, eat it, and sleep, and maybe spend a little time mating or whatever. But there's a lot of, lot of downtime. And our ancestors had a lot of downtime as well. I mean, uh, maybe they were doing f survival activities, food gathering, whatever, uh, 10 to 20 hours a week tops. So there's a lot of downtime. So our genes are really geared for downtime. Now, a number of things happen during downtime when you're not exerting yourself. You really need that downtime for deribose regeneration. You need the deribose. The basic physiological unit is ATP, 
You want to make a note of this. The powerhouse in the body are the mitochondria. Mitochondria. They're in all the muscle cells. They're, they're in the heart. They're in the brain. And I should mention that exercise increases the number of mitochondria throughout the body and the muscles and increases the number even in the brain. So the mitochondria, what happens is you have glucose, that's glucose or fatty tissue or fatty acids are burned in the mitochondria as fuel. The glucose first and that's used up and it burns the fatty acids. But you have to have oxygen for that to be burned. But there's another ingredient. You need ATP and you can't get ATP without D-ribose. And we have D-ribose, that's the product Dr. Nuremberg's power sugar, which has xylitol and D-ribose. It's really necessary for regenerating, uh, regenerating the muscles for muscle recovery, for energy, strength, and endurance. Dr. Nuremberg's power sugar does that. It has the antimicrobial properties through the xylitol, but it has the power component through the D-ribose. So that downtime allowed for the regeneration of the D-ribose and the ATP buildup. And we're not getting that downtime. So we really need a lot of supplemental D-ribose, which Dr. Nemerick's Power Sugar would provide for us. If we're not living really in a way that's consistent with our genetic background. So downtime was also important for MME. You have to have that D-ribose there. An MME would be an example where I did a truck pull with one truck with 16 people while sitting on the ground. Another truck pulled before my 70th birthday. I'm sitting on the ground. We hooked up two F-150 Ford pickup trucks with six guys, average weight of 250 pounds. That's 14,000 pounds. They sat on the ground, and I pulled it. When I was 65, drug-free, Nuremberg style, no wraps, no scraps, no bench press shirt, no drugs, just me, I bench pressed 365 pounds. That's an MME, momentary maximal exertion. At about that age as well, I held a world record on a T-bar strongman pull where I'm horizontal to the ground, and I pulled up 270 pounds. So they're all different kind of MMEs. Then at uh, 70 years of age, I set a world record on a power pull-up uh, where I hung 140 pounds from a chain belt around my waist, and then I did a pull-up with 140 pounds hanging on me. It was a world record on a power pull-up. Also, my 70th year, uh, I set a world record on a power grip, a grip of 195, 195 pounds per square inch. It's a momentary maximal exertion. Just to give you an idea what that means, a very big football player uh, from Whittier College did 140 pounds per square inch, which is a good squeeze. Mine was 195 because of my MME training. Uh, I had a world record on the power shrug of 480 pounds using the traps with, on a Smith machine of shrugging it up, shrugging that up. So, what the best way of doing MME training is to do at least once you're in, you have to be in general, generally fit so you don't hurt yourself. And then at least once a week, you have to do a maximal effort at something. And by something, I mean enough where it either does one of the following. It gives you a, a blood pressure spike, where your blood pressure shoots up because so much pre you had to exert so much pressure, or you were sweating or your heart rate went way up. Now you can get that from a, a sprint, where you run 30 seconds with everything you've got. That's an MME. Or you can even do reps. You can Whatever reps you can do is military press or curls or whatever uh, with enough weight. So by the, uh, 30 seconds, you, you're just burning. You just can't move it anymore. So you, those last reps were MMEs. I mean, the first couple of reps weren't, but the last few reps, as you, the last couple of ones, you're fighting for them. And it's in, so the last few reps become an MME. Now, what happens with MMEs? One thing we know happens, this is a fact, it'll increase testosterone production. MMEs will increase testosterone production. You're lifting 
heavy deadlift or a squat or a bench press or a power pull-up, leg press, uh, you, your testosterone production goes up. Now, testosterone, in addition to boosting up your strength, is very good for cardiovascular health, very good for cholesterol control, very good for heart health. So here you can get an idea of a mechanism of longevity. One, one of the mechanisms would be through the testosterone, male or female, that has those health benefits. And that comes with MME. Now, keep in mind, bodybuilders will take reps, maybe go 20, 30 reps, they take a lighter weight and do a lot of reps. Now, there's nothing that I can think of in our ancestry that resembles that. No caveman was doing anything, just taking something and just doing some repetitive thing over and over, the same exact motion over and over again uh, that would resemble that type of training. Now, the other thing I want to mention is in the muscles, you have myofibrils. That's the muscle fiber themselves. And when you're doing MME training, you're going anywhere from one to five reps tops, generally about three or four reps, heavy weight, when you're working out. And it increases the size of the myofibrils, which is made of the actin and the myosin, and leads to myofibrillar hypertrophy. Myofibrillar hypertrophy. I want to make a note of that. Myofibrillar hypertrophy. So the muscle fiber itself is getting bigger. Now sometimes when you get a stretch, let's say you're taking a dumbbell or whatever, and you're stretching it like that, and it's heavy, there's some research to indicate that actually you get more muscle fibers. The muscle fibers start splitting, so you end up getting bigger muscles because the, the fibers start splitting. And so you end up with more fibers. But generally, the theory was that you're just getting the, that you don't create new muscle fibers; that the existing ones get bigger, bigger, which is myofibrillar hypertrophy. Then you have sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. Sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. That's the energy fluid around the muscle, which has the the glycogen in it, uh, that has the uh, mitochondria in it, the water. For every gram of glycogen you have in there you get maybe two to three grams of water, so it brings the water in, and you get the hypertrophy. Bodybuilders typically do a lot of reps and build up the sarcoplasm, so they get hy sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, which won't last as long. If they stop working out, it'll go down faster than will myofibrillar hypertrophy. Myofibrillar hypertrophy that a power lifter or a power athlete has will last longer if he stops working out. Now, the more MME training you do, you do, your, you do your general conditioning, and then you do your MME training. The MME training, by getting stronger, then even for a bodybuilder, it would be, it would be helpful because then he can lift heavier weights when he's, doing, uh, when he's going for repetitions. So instead of using uh, 70 pounds on a barbell for curls, he can do the same number of reps using maybe 80 or 90 or 100 pounds because he's because he has the myofibrillar, myofibrillar uh, hypertrophy. The myofibrils themselves are, are stronger and bigger. So these are some of the uh, aspects of MME training, where you're going heavy. It's the fruit of being generally in shape. If you're in shape and you're not doing this, you're missing out on one of the real benefits. Now, keep in mind, now when you're doing MME, the adrenaline gland is, you're getting, a, you're getting an adrenaline rush because you've got all this weight on you. Now, our ancestors were in dangerous situations. Now, if you look at all the lifts that represent the most threatening, the feel the most dangerous, if you're doing a curl, or you're doing um, uh, a, uh, a squat or even a deadlift, particularly, say, say the deadlift. I mean, you, if you're pulling that weight off the ground, you can always just drop it. It's too heavy. Uh, it, it's my theory that the one that's most intimidating to people is the bench press. 
presents a sense of danger. And why do I say that? You're lying on your back and you're bringing down heavy weight towards your body. Could hit your neck, your chest. It's falling off on you. I mean, it's coming down on you. There's a threat. All that weight's coming down towards your chest or your neck. Depends where you usually you're gonna have it over here. You might start off here, but you're gonna come down over your chest. You got all that weight coming down on you. And if you let it go, even if you have a spot, it's not going to get it fast enough. It's going to crush you. So my theory is that the bench press represents the greatest threat psychologically to any strength athlete. And with a squat, you've got it back here. You could get hurt, but you're not seeing the weight coming down on you. The deadlift, you're pulling it off the ground. Do a power pull-up, you can just let go of the bar and come down. But this is one... It's all on you, and anything happens, it's going to come down on you. Uh, part of the MME concept, I think to the extent that there's danger involved in the training, uh, I think there's extra benefit because that's part also of our genetic history. Our, our ancestors were endangered. I mean, they weren't doing it just to impress anybody. I mean, they were just trying to literally survive. So part of my theory is that whatever we do that involves MME related to closer resembles survival, the more benefit we're going to get. Of course, after a while, you get less and less intimidated by it, but, but I believe the intimidation process is part of the health benefit of it. Because you build up confidence, and after a while, you're less threatened by it. So to the extent that we're simulating the caveman times, then we're receiving the maximal genetic benefit. Probably the bench press in terms of the danger component. And that's a pretty bold statement I'm making there as well. Probably feels psychologically the most life-threatening. Because all this weight is coming down towards you. Only under your control only. Okay, I'm going to stop there, give you a chance to uh, comment or ask any questions you may have on that. So this applies to men? Men and women, because and women, be, well, more I so... I know they do that too, but uh, I mean, most women don't. Most women don't. I would say, you know, it, it, most women are... Uh, but if you look at prehistoric times, I think mostly it was the men that had to step in front of the animal and so forth, but the women had to be ready for it. I mean, they didn't have an easy time of it. They probably had to get in there and grunt and push things and everything else in addition to food gathering. I mean, eventually, uh, there was a division of labor. You know, particularly we had the time of the hoe. A woman could take the hoe and, and plant things, and uh, she could be doing some work out in the field. But then we went to the plow. The men, that, that required them as... We progressed, the man, then we had to plow, the man pulled that plow, then it, then it was more of a division in the women with reproduction, men were dealing with production, women reproduction once we went to the plow. We had the hoe, the woman could be out there doing some work. But we're talking, our genetics weren't even caught up to that, our genes were back to where women the cavemen they weren't even planting, it, was not, it wasn't even an agricultural society. Our genes haven't caught up to anywhere near where we are now, to this type of life. Maybe in 30, 40, 50,000 years from now, it'll be caught up to this kind of frenetic life. But it's really, we're still based, our well-being is still based on a genetic makeup from tens of thousands of years ago. And so we want to, to the extent that we simulate that, we're activating uh, the good genes for our survival. Another aspect of MME training is just handling the weight. So let's say you want to do a heavy bench press. Uh, you can go on a Smith machine, for example, and just lock out three inches. You can put a lot of weight on it, but you're handling the weight. You're getting your tendons and your ligaments used to it. You're just pushing it three inches. When I, before I set my world record of 365 pounds, I was locking out about 560 pounds on a three-inch lockout. Uh, you have people who use boards, they put boards on their chest, they have a couple of spotters, and they bring the weights down, the free weights down, they, top, they hit the top of the board and bring it up, but they're handling the weights. 
So to lift a heavy weight, you need some amount of time of just handling. You need some time handling, even if you can't do the full lift. For example, when i practicing now for power, a new world record or a power pull-up, I'll, I'll hang anywhere from 180, 190 pounds from a chain belt and just do partial pull-ups. Maybe just come up an inch or two. Partial pull-ups. Just getting used to handling the weight, strengthening, strengthening the tendons and the ligaments. And psychologically, just getting used to seeing all that weight. Just seeing all that weight. Or getting used to having it hang from my hips. Or on the bench press, just used to seeing all those weight on the bars. So after I had over five plates on the bar, uh, on a lockout, it didn't look so much when I had to do 365. It didn't, didn't look as menacing. And when you first handle a bar, it doesn't feel heavy because it used to more weight. So a key of MME training is overload, handling a lot of weight. And this is healthy for women. I mean, you don't have to become big and buff, but uh, a woman wants to keep her tendons and ligaments strengthened uh, and so she can get very uh, tremendous focus. So that's the MME training. I'm going to go into the physiological and psychological effects. Uh, I'm going to ask you... Uh, if you have any comments or questions. I should also mention, to get the most testosterone production, you're you really using your legs, whether you're doing squats or leg presses. I like to use a leg press machine, but squats are even better because you get some more balancing in there. But I'll use the leg press, and then I take a lot of weight and just, just to get the testosterone production and keep your legs strong. I should mention that if you want to build big arms, the best way to do it is to build your legs, do squats or leg presses. Why is that? Because you kick up your testosterone production, then when you do, say, curls, your biceps will actually get bigger than if you hadn't done those leg presses or squats because the testosterone helps it get bigger and stronger. If you do your curls first and then leg presses, your arms won't get the benefit of it. You have to do the heavy weight first. Do your MME first. In my training, I do some kind of MME every day. It's always something different. Could be bench press lockout, leg press, uh, partial deadlifts, power pull up, partial pull ups, um, or on a Smith machine, a, a simulated truck pull. So there's always some kind of MME every day, but a different muscle group. You don't want to do the same muscle group every day. Probably in the caveman times, they probably had to go through a maximum muscle exertion. It wasn't going to be every day. Probably had to do it maybe once in a while, once a week, once a month, but they had to be ready for that. Any comments or questions at this point? Okay. Yes. Um, I'm trying to work on um, getting a routine going with kettlebells. Um, how would I implement that with my workout? Do I just get a heavier one? Kettlebells are really good uh, in terms of uh, condi overall conditioning. Uh, yeah, and, and cardio. Uh, in, in terms of getting an MME, I, and that's a good background for getting your MME. So you might want to go... You build yourself up to heavier weights with it, but uh, and, and you you can get really heavy. I mean, you you can get where you're doing very heavy weights and lifting it and coming down and pushing them up or whatever. But it's good for I, I think overall, at least in the West over here, it's just good for all, we we like to most people use for overall conditioning. Although you can go quite far with a kettlebell. Some people who say the best conditioning strength or just overall conditioning there'll be some people who claim that the kettlebell is best but most of us in the west don't don't use it that much i have kettlebells that go sometimes i use it sometimes i don't use it it's not a staple for me but it's more of a natural movement because you're, you're 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 moving in a more natural way with it than you are with a linear movement with weights with the barbell or the dumbbell so doing some reps with the heavier one won't give me the mme that i'm yeah, you want to have yeah, you want to get heavy where you, you you can get maybe only three to five reps. If you can do more than five reps, it means you could use more weights. And I want to mention to you that if you want to lose body fat, the best way is to build muscle. 
you want to make a, a note of this. If you want to lose body fat, the best way is to build muscle. Because your muscle raises, to the extent you have muscle, it raises your metabolism and you're burning calories even when you sleep to supply the muscle with nutrients, to, to repair the, the micro tears in the muscles from the workout. So building muscle is, is the most excellent way of losing body fat. And women are not genetically geared unless they, you know, they want to be a bodybuilder and they're taking uh, steroids. They're not going to get really massive muscle look on feminine if they have muscle. They look more toned up and that toning and strengthening and, and enlargement of muscle, a little enlargement that happens. Uh, you'll still be, look feminine, but you'll be burning up muscle. That's the good thing about the strength training or MME. So keep in mind, I've created the term MME. The term MMA exists now, mixed martial arts. <laughs> so this is MME for MMA, or however you want to look at it. Momentary maximal exertion, resurge with health and longevity. Now, if you look at our ancestors, if they had to fight someone, they MME right then, or they had to move something heavy, they didn't do it over and over again. Once they defeated the enemy, it was over. Or once they moved that rock, it was done. We have what are called sets. You do certain three to five reps in, 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 in strength training, and then you might do four sets. You rest up. When you're developing strength training, it's usually like anywhere from two to four minutes. And then you do another set, you recover it, and then you do it again, and then you do it again. But if we look at the prototype of our ancestors, it's really one set. So my theory is you get the most benefit out of the first set. The most benefits from the first set, because that, that also most resembles a genetic code from tens of thousands of years ago. There were not multiple sets. There was that MME Boom, and it was over. So it'll be one set. Some people do five sets, ten sets, although the research indicates for maximum strength development, four, but I believe that the first set is what gets you the maximum results. So if you go one set, you can even do another set the next day without overtraining. If you train the same muscle group too much, too often, too hard, you'll get what's called overtraining. Then you're more prone to injuries, and you actually get to a point where you lose strength. So if you want to go for a world record or a personal record, I personally want to go for a world record, don't even do anything for one week. I don't touch any weights. I rest a lot. I eat. Store up the glycogen stores. Make sure my uh, D-ribo stores and glycogen stores and ATP stores are built up, and then I'm ready to go. And again, that resembles our ancestors. They were at a lot of downtime. And it certainly applies. Any strength athlete knows you need downtime before you're going for a world record or a personal record. You need to really rest. Now, when you're just starting out, you're taking light weights, you can do it every day for a while because you're just, you're just trying to... When you first start working out, you're not really trying to build up. You're just trying to wake up your muscles. You're just trying to wake things up. If you go... Heavy to begin with, you're going to hurt yourself. So the first month, you want to take it really easy. So my theory is the first set, you get more benefit out of the first set than the rest. So in a way, you're better off going one, one heavy set with one exercise and going with another heavy set with another exercise, and you're getting the maximal training for both, for different muscle groups. Which will you get more of, doing the four sets of one or doing getting a maximum benefit of heavy on one and then going another one set on another? Say doing bench presses, one set of bench presses, one set of power pull-ups, one set of uh, uh, leg presses or squats. I think in terms of use of your time and your energy, you might want to consider a heavy set of each of those than going four sets on one. And also, if you do, let's say, one set on a bench press one day, you, you probably can do another set the next day without overtraining. Whereas if you do your four sets of one day, you got your main benefit from the first set, 
you, you can't do it the next day. But you, the next day you can do it again. You get maximum benefit from the first set again. Now, when you, one of the things happens is when you're going MME, there's also a detoxification. Uh, one, the sweat, the heartbeat going up, but also there's more uh, excrement. I mean, many uh, power lifters will have a bowel movement after lifting heavy, heavy weights. It'll, it'll actually get the excrement out. Uh, and that's healthy. You don't, you don't want to have, you want to be getting waste materials regularly. And, and heavy weights will do that. Also, in terms of getting maximum myoneural efficiency, let's talk about myoneural efficiency. You want to remember that term, myoneural efficiency. So that's the nerves. You, want, you have to be able to recruit nerve. Each nerve, there's many neurons. So you get a bundle of nerves. And just like a muscle, it really has many fibers. So each one either contracts or it doesn't contract. Each neuron either fires or it doesn't fire. So the key is to recruit as many neurons firing and as many uh, muscle fibers firing. So when you're lifting heavy weight, you're, you're getting maximal firing. The most neurons are firing with MME. The most muscle fibers are contracting. And you have a, you have a junction with a nerve and a synapse. It's called the myoneural junction. The myoneural junction. And you have... A neuro, you have electrical activity and a neurohumor such as acetylcholine that stimulate the muscle fiber. So it takes an electrical impulse, an electrical chemical impulse to stimulate the muscle, each fiber to contract. The more fibers that contract, the bigger the contraction. So when you're lifting heavily, you're getting maximum recruitment. So when you're used to doing that, you need to get that full power, it's like, boom, you're ready to go because you've done it. You, you're used to maximum recruitment. You've trained. What have you trained? you trained your nervous system. You know, it's just not all muscle here. It's muscle, it's neurons, and breath. The air is the secret reservoir of strength. You want to get maximum oxygen. So you want to be doing your diaphragmatic breathing. You want to keep yourself well oxygenated at all times. Because strength, the immediate strength that's there, you have to have the ATP. So you have to have the glucose in there. You have to have the, 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 the D-ribose. The neurons have to be firing. Muscles have to be in maximal health. But you, the key things are the, the, the muscles, the neurons, and your breath. So the secret source of strength is, your, is, is the breath, oxygen, the air. The secret strength muscle for all the exercise is the diaphragm, intra-abdominal pressure. So the detoxification, there's a focus. You're getting neural efficiency. You're getting myofibrillar efficiency. And you're getting to a point where you can have rapid recruitment. So if you needed to exert yourself, anything comes up, some unexpected thing comes up, you're able to focus and move fast and hard. So it's really a mild neural condition. It's not just a muscle exercise. As a matter of fact, when, you, when people start getting fatigued and they can't lift anymore, it's usually not the muscles that went out. It's not the muscle. It's the neurons. Your, 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 your neurons will adapt out before your muscles will. So you have to have good neural health. You want to make sure you have your electrolytes, like your calcium, sodium, potassium, your B vitamins. You want to make sure the neurons are healthy because that, that's what goes out first. And of course, your, your hormones are going. They're another source of strength, the adrenaline. So if you, have, if you have adrenal fatigue, you're going to have a problem because you're going to need that adrenaline. One thing you want to keep your adrenals strong, which is particularly important for fight and flight, which is which a lot involved in MME. It's, it's sort of a simulated fight-flight situation. You, you can't have – many people have adrenal fatigue. The herb ashwagandha. You want to write that down, spell as best you can. Ashwagandha. Very good for your adrenals. 
ashwagandha. It also helps with insomnia. It's good for the thyroid. But you really want it for your adrenals because that's your power gland, your adrenals. Is that like a capsule, like a vitamin? Yeah, you get it as a capsule. It's a, it's a root, but you can get it in a capsule form. Ashwagandha. So you've got your diaphragm, intra-abdominal pressure, your adrenal gland, your nerves, your muscles, your oxygen. Now, an important part of the strength is tendons and ligaments. The tendons attach your muscles to bone. Your ligaments attach bone to bone. That's what the joints are made of, tendons and ligaments. You have to have that be really strong. And a good way of doing it is getting used to just moving heavy weights, small distances. Like, like I was mentioning, a bench press lockout. You're just moving it three inches or lifting any weight, just a couple of inches, just getting your tendons and ligaments used to it. Like our ancestors, they had to move heavy things. They had to go MME on a regular basis. See, so to do MME, you have to have strong tendons and ligaments. It's another part of the power. They actually get stronger and bigger. And, of course, the more you're doing these exercises, you're increasing your mitochondria, the powerhouses in the body, both in the brain and in the muscles. All the cells have mitochondria. That's the powerhouse. The glucose, the oxygen, and then what ignites the power is the derive. It's sort of like in a car. You have the gasoline. You've got oxygen for combustion. But without turning on the switch, it won't go. You've got to turn the switch on. There's an ignition spark and ignites it. Or well, the spark that ignites the powerhouse of the mitochondria is the D-ribose, as found in Dr. Nuremberg's power sugar, has the D-ribose in it. So that's, the, that's what ignites the power in the mitochondria. So that's the powerhouse. So for power, those mitochondria have to be really working well. That's at a, at a cellular level. You need those mitochondria well supplied and well functioning, which needs oxygen, glucose, ATP, which is dependent then on D-ribose. Also, when you're contracting your muscles, that moves the lymph. So your heart moves the blood. That's the circulation for your, for your blood. But what moves the lymph through the lymph nodes and through your lymph system? It's muscle contraction. And that detoxifies you. It's another source of detoxification to the lymph system. An important aspect of MME training, I'm going to give you a mental one. And by the way, this, the more you do the MME training, your self-confidence goes up uh, tremendously. The power of sugar also will give you a power surge to the extent that you live a, a spiritual life and you can call upon the Holy Spirit. But you can't just do that when you're exercising. It's got to be a way of life. The Holy Spirit and joy also adds muscular power. To the extent you, if you're depressed or whatever, you can have less, to put, less, you can have less power. To the extent you feel with joy, and you're leading uh, a, a deeply spiritual life, you can, then the Holy Spirit's available, and that activates greater power. But the power thought you want, and you should practice right now to do this, I can, I will. I can, I will. We're going to do some deep breathing. We're going to listen to us say, say the power thought. But the one that's the call to action is the word now. So when I set my world records, I'll go, I can, I will. But I go, I can, I will. I can, I will. Now, but when I go now, I'm in. doesn't matter what happens, I'm in. So let's take a deep breath. Hold it. Exhale. I can, I will. I can, I will. I can, I will. Now. Boom, and then you're in once you go. But when you're practicing this, just practice I can, I will. Because you're only going to use now when you're really going to jump into action, lifting that weight. So in, in summarizing again, my theory about MME is that it's a CR mimetic that actually activates longevity genes, uh, just like resveratrol or corsetin can do as, as food supplements. It turns on longevity genes and turns off different 
genes that cause, turns down gene expression that cause pathology. And this is more, an MME training is more in line with our ancestral genetic blueprint. Thank you, it's been a privilege to be here with you. I'm grateful to those of you here in the room, those watching on DVD, and those listening on CD. Thank you.